Hello and welcome! In this coding session, we'll train a simple neural network that classifies hundreds of digits using the famous MNIST dataset. Let's start with defining our data layer, which will pre-process the data and feed it to our model. It will input a data tensor, which is an n-dimensional array that has our entire dataset. I'll show where to get this tensor later. Let's create a variable scope to keep things organized. We don't have to use a variable scope here, but doing so has some benefits, such as having a clean and nice looking computation graph. We'll use the dataset module to read the data from a tensor, which will be a NumPy matrix. We'll shuffle the data using a buffer with a size of 60,000 samples, which is the size of the dataset. The buffer size doesn't have to be as large as the dataset, especially if your dataset is huge. We'll repeat this dataset so that we can iterate over the same data multiple times. Then we'll use the map function to pre-process data using a function that we'll define right now. This function inputs the images and their corresponding labels. We'll call this function using the map function. The map function allows for running functions in parallel, that's why we are using it here. So we can pre-process the data on several threads in parallel. Let's go back to our pre-processing function to implement it. We'll first convert our image, input image, from unsigned integer to a floating point matrix. Then we'll divide it by 127 and a half and subtract 1 to scale the data between minus 1 and 1. We'll reshape the image to flatten it. This will convert our n by n images into arrays of 1 by n squared values. Then we'll return the process data. As you may have noticed, we didn't do anything to the labels. So this function technically doesn't need to input them, but removing it breaks the map function, so let's leave it as is for now. We will also feed the data in batches, let's say batches of 32, which is a typical batch size. To prevent data pre-processing and input output bottlenecks, we can buffer the data so that the GPU doesn't wait for it every single time. Let's have a buffer size of 100. And finally, we'll create an iterator that will return us the next batch of data every time we call it. Now we can go ahead and define our model. There are many ways to do this in TensorFlow. You can implement it from scratch using the core TensorFlow functions, or use a high-level API such as the TF Layers module. I'll use the TF Layers API in this example. I'll first create a dense layer, also known as a fully connected layer, with 512 hidden units, which inputs the images that'll come from the iterator. Then I'll pass the output through a rectified linear unit function, ReLU, which will add some non-linearity to our model. Then I'll create the output layer, which is another dense layer that has as many units as the number of classes. This model is an example of a very simple multi-layer perceptron. All right, we'll need a loss function to optimize this model. Our loss function will tell us how close the model uh, outputs are to the ground truth labels. Let's put the model under a variable scope too, like we did earlier, and name it loss. Let's do the same for the model and create a variable scope also here. We'll convert our labels to one-hot arrays so that we can feed them into a cross-entropy loss function as the target probability distribution. 
Then we'll define our loss function, which inputs this one hot probability tensor and the logits, which are the outputs we get from our model before we feed it into a softmax function. Now we'll define an optimizer to optimize our model using this loss function that we just created. Let's use the good old plain gradient descent optimizer. We'll discuss the other options later in this series. We need to set the learning rate here, which sets the size of the steps we take at every optimization step. We'll create this operation that will minimize the loss function for one step every time we call it. We'll keep track of the number of steps we have taken using a global step variable. Now it's time to define a performance metric to see how well our model is doing. I'll use accuracy as the performance metric here. We'll get our model's predictions by undoing the one-hot encoding first. This gives us the index of the output units with the largest activation. We don't have to do anything to the ground truth labels besides a typecasting that'll ensure that both predicted and ground truth labels are of the same type. Then we can define the accuracy as the mean of a binary mask that shows whether a sample is correctly classified or not. We need to convert this binary mask to a float array so that the mean function works properly. Finally, we can train this model. First, let's define a variable to keep track of the steps the model will take during the optimization. Now let's define the training graph. We'll get the images and their corresponding labels from the iterator that is returned by the data layer. We still don't have the status tensor, but we'll have it soon. I'll, I'll show that in a moment. We'll feed these images into our model. Now we'll call our loss function, which will get its logis from our model and the labels from the data layer. We'll feed this loss into the optimizer to minimize it. We'll also create an operation for the accuracy. To start the training process, we'll need to create a session and run the training graph. But we need to initialize all the variables first, like we did in the previous session. Then we'll run the training graph for many iterations in a loop until the model converges. For now, let's say we want to run this for 10,000 iterations. We'll run the optimizer up. which will return nothing. We'll also run the loss and accuracy ops to keep track of them. At each iteration, we'll be feeding the next batch of data to the model, and we'll get the values for the loss and accuracy for the current batch. Every once in a while, we can print these values to see how the training is going. I'll average the loss and accuracy over the batches between every log to get smoother results. 
I'll print the iteration number first. And then I'm going to print the streaming loss with this much precision, which will be enough for this. And then I'll print the streaming accuracy with the same precision. Now I'm going to format the string, the iteration number i, and then our streaming loss, and then our streaming accuracy. And we haven't defined these yet. Let's initialize them here to zero. And then we're going to accumulate the values inside the loop. So the streaming loss at this point will be the total streaming loss between the logs. And same for this streaming accuracy. And now we need to divide these by the number of log iterations to get the mean values for the streaming loss and the streaming accuracy. And every time we print them, we need to reset them back to zero. Finally, we'll load the data set, feed it into our training function, and let the model train. It's very easy to load the MNIST data set through the Keras module Keras is a high-level neural network API that has become part of TensorFlow since the version 1.2. Therefore, we don't need to install it separately. Loading data is not always this easy. In the upcoming lectures, we'll see how to load and pre-process custom data too. If you're curious to see how these images in this dataset actually look like, you can take a look at this IPython notebook that I put on the GitHub repository for this series. I printed the shape of the data tensors here. We have 60,000 training sample images and their corresponding labels. Similarly, we have 10,000 test samples and the ground truth labels. Each one of these samples is a 28 by 28 image. If you display one of these samples using matplotlib, this is how it looks like. All right, the moment of truth. Let's burn some GPU. I'm running this on a GPU by default, but it would probably run as fast on a decent CPU as well. So you don't really need a GPU for this particular example but you'll eventually need one if you want to develop state-of-the-art deep learning models. It's going to download the dataset first, if it's your first time running it. So far, we haven't used the validation set at all. You might wonder why we need a separate validation set in the first place. The answer is to make sure that the model generalizes well to unseen data, to have an idea of the actual performance of the model. We'll talk about that in the next session. Even after very few epochs, we get a model that can classify the handwritten digits in the training set with a 98% accuracy. All right, that's all for today. I hope you found it useful. If you're not familiar with the deep learning concepts, I would strongly recommend watching the deep learning crash course series that I made earlier. I'll also put the links to the relevant videos in the description below. Subscribe for more videos, and as always, thanks for watching, stay tuned, and see you next time.